Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be moderating this next panel, uh, which is titled Making Images Accessible Across Ind Industries. How does it work and what's next? And just to do a quick um, introduction to myself, uh, my name is Carolyn DeRosier. I'm the founder and CEO of Scribely. And today um, I am wearing my hair down. I have medium length um, wavy auburn hair and I'm wearing a black blouse and sitting in front of a forest background. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, today we have a very unique opportunity uh, to learn from a panel of industry experts who have all been working on improving alt text within their own organizations. Uh, so they are really closely connected to this work and um, we're going to learn from them today. Uh, really excited to bring everyone together on this topic to talk about how alt text works right now and um, some of the changes that we can make to improve the quality and and the availability of alt text on the web. So the organizations and industries that we have joining us today include the Smithsonian Institution, representing the cultural and heritage sector, Macmillan Learning, representing educational publishing, and Mori Creative Studios, representing marketing services and web design. Um, and now I'd like to um, take this time to invite each one of our panelists to um, introduce themselves and do a quick visual description. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Kaylin first to do an introduction. Hello, uh, my name is Kaylin Meyer and I am a collections technician from the National Museum of Natural History where I work with the collections and I think about digital accessibility concerns. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am a white woman with uh, small black framed glasses and very long dark brown hair. Um, and I'm wearing a black blouse today with a green sweater. And my background is an image of an aspen forest grove in front of a pond on a very overcast day. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kate Sherwood. I use both she, her, and they, them pronouns. I am a photographer for the Smithsonian's Natural Museum of Natural History. Our office um, is the Office of Photography and Media and we're in charge of photographing and archiving um, images of the museum, research, scientists, anything involving the Natural History Museum. I am a white, non-binary, invisibly disabled human. I have buzz red hair. Um, I'm wearing a dark green and red flowered button down, and I'm sitting in front of white bookshelves. My black and white tuxedo cat, Stephen, will probably make an appearance at some point during the talk today. Hello, I'm Rebecca Snyder, the informatics branch chief at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. So I am a data nerd and policy person. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a white female, also with red hair and blue glasses, and I'm sitting in a room with three abstract paintings behind me, and also we'll have possibly two tabby cats running back and forth. Hi, uh, my name is Rachel Kemmerford. I'm the Senior Director of Communications and Outreach for Accessibility at Macmillan Learning. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, Right now I am wearing a pink and black plaid blouse with a black sweater and have my rainbow bookcase in the background. Um, I will probably be interrupted not just by an fat elderly cat, but also by a very excitable seven-year-old. Hello there, John Sasala, he, him. I am the president of Mori Creative Studios, an inbound marketing agency. I am a middle-aged white male with short hair, uh, thick, uh, dark black framed glasses, sitting in my office wearing my black Mori Creative fleece uh, with a, a ship wood uh, or shiplap wood wall behind me and the Mori Creative logo. Um, yeah, and that's me. Great. Thanks everyone. And um, the chat box is active. Uh, Lucia says, hello, um, Smithsonian people heart. And David Ricks says, cats rule. So um, we're off to a good start. <laughs> All right, so before getting into individual presentations and questions, I just wanted to do a brief introduction uh, just to provide some framework and context for our discussion today. 
So what is the problem exactly when it comes to uh, alt text on the web? The fact is most images on the web have missing, inaccurate, or incomplete alt text, and we need to change this. Accessible images are absolutely critical for people who use and rely on alternative forms of access, as David um, mentioned in his introduction, and as we um, also saw in Sam's presentation. Um, also, um, as we'll learn more from John later, um, improperly tagged images also make it difficult for Google to index your images properly, which um, ultimately negatively impacts your SEO or search engine optimization. And finally, um, skipping alt text makes it more expensive to correct this issue later on. And um, in the rehearsal, we were all talking about this wonderful food analogy quote from Lainey Feingold. She's a disability rights attorney. Um, so I just wanted to drop that here. Lainey says, you cannot put the blueberries into the muffin after it's cooked. And that's such a wonderful quote because basically what Lainey is getting at is, you have to begin this work from the very beginning, um, or you'll be stuck with a very dull and dry end product that could have otherwise been delicious. She also has another amazing food analogy that I wanted to drop here as well. Um, if you ignore your ice cream cone, it gets very messy. Another great point there. Um, you need to be doing something to manage your ice cream or manage your accessibility over time. Um, and this will ultimately help you uh, build better content. So um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the existing standards, laws, and regulations. As we heard earlier on, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG, is the most widely recognized standard for web accessibility policies and regulations, and is the basis for um, laws such as the um, Americans, Americans with Disabilities Act, the UK Equality Act, and the European Accessibility Act. Um, and the WCAG guidelines were actually created over 20 years at the, uh, ago at this point. And um, alt text was always there from the very beginning. In fact, it's, um, it's under success criterion 1.1.1. So it's not exactly new, um, but it's very critical to web accessibility. Um, but thinking beyond compliance, uh, alt text has a higher purpose because it's ultimately about equal access to information and building more inclusive web experiences that everyone can benefit from and enjoy. Um, <clears throat> also, digital accessibility lawsuits have been on the rise for the past several years. According to UsableNet that collects data on accessibility lawsuits, there were 3,500 accessibility lawsuits in 2020, which is a 23% increase year over year. And it's not slowing down at all in 2021. The mid-year report done by um, UsableNet for 2021 estimates that we'll have 4,150 lawsuits or an increase of 18% year over year. And these numbers, um, you have to remember, don't even include uh, accessibility demand letters that are sent out. So there are actually more accessibility complaints than that. Um, at this point, a legal precedent has been established to sue both private and federally funded organizations that do not comply with WCAG accessibility guidelines. And that's because accessibility um, is a civil right. Um, so everyone needs to be concerned with this for their web presence. So what's the solution? Uh, what happens next is uh, really up to us. We can't build accessible web um, without the prioritization and ongoing commitment of organizations and industries. And that's why I'm so glad this conversation is happening right now. Uh, today, we have the opportunity to learn from forward thinking industry experts uh, who are all doing what it takes to improve alt text and design creative solutions to make the 2020s the decade for accessibility. So in terms of how we're going to structure this conversation, uh, first we'll have individual presenters talk about existing alt text workflows and challenges, um, also initiatives within their organizations and industries. And then after that, we're going to open it up to a group discussion um, and talk through you know, some of the opportunities to improve image accessibility and the possibilities for integrating these new IPTC properties that we uh, learned about at the beginning of this conference. And throughout the session, I will be doing my best to field questions from the Zoom chat box. So please feel free to drop your questions there and hopefully we'll get them answered for you. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first presentation from Kate, Kaylin, and Rebecca at the Smithsonian. Uh, so you can go ahead and share your screen now.
Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So uh, this is Kate speaking. Um, and Kaylin, go ahead. Okay, um, this is Kaylin speaking. Um, I'm just gonna describe my slide here. The title of the slide is NMNH Guidelines for Writing Image Descriptions for Digital Accessibility. And there's an image of the cover of our guide. Um, it's a photograph on the right of the right side and face of an African elephant on display in our central rotunda. And the shot is taken at an upwards angle from the ground, so you can also see the upper three floors of the rotunda and their marble columns and balconies. And I wanted to start um, by saying that the, um, the US government has specific laws concerning technology and accessibility. And the most prominent of these is the 1973 Rehabilitation Act, Section 508 which says that the government must ensure that all the technology it uses is accessible to people with disabilities. And for us as a museum, this means our digital media must meet WCAG standards. Um, images play a huge role in our outreach efforts to the public. So in order to meet WCAG standards, we started researching and writing a national history specific guide to image descriptions to make certain that we could all follow standards with them. But we soon found that the primary museums working on image descriptions were art museums, um, not natural history museums. Um, the most famous of these projects is probably the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago with their Coyote Software Project that was started in 2015 or 2016. Um, but we couldn't use an art museum's guide because natural history museums are very different in purpose and function. We're extremely concerned with maintaining collections for scientific research and our images act as surrogates for our specimens. But, you know, the art guides focus a lot on evocation and expressing art styles and things that just really didn't apply to the context of our own images. So our guide essentially started from scratch on what it means to write image descriptions for scientific surrogates. Uh, Kate, change slide, please. Okay, so the title of this slide is Natural History Specific Concerns. And the slide has three bullet points that read scientific names and common names, department-specific subject matter instructions, and mass digitization efforts. Um, there's also an image along the right side of the screen showing three mass digitization photo examples. These photos are all of the dorsal view or the back side of carpenter bees with the scientific name Xylocopa tuniscapa. The bees are black in color. Um, they have slightly blue tinted wings. And two of the images have their wings and legs folded in, but the last image has the wings and the legs extended outwards from the body. So these are some of the things that we insisted on including for natural history image descriptions. First, we, we must always include the scientific name as well as a common name. People are more likely to know the phrase grizzly bear over Ursus Arctus um, horribilis, um, but the common names vary by region and countries, so we need to include both. Um, and second, Many of our collecting units wrote directions for what they always want described for their own specimens. Uh, for instance, paleobiology said that the matrix surrounding fossils holds a significant amount of data. So they want image descriptions to pay just as much attention to what the matrix looks like as it pays to the fossils. And finally, a major issue we had to solve was that many of our images are taken in mass digitization efforts where we've taken an image of every specimen of a particular species or genus or family and they all are incredibly similar looking. Um, so our guidelines needed to address how to handle these similar images where there could be hundreds or thousands of one species that have minute differences between them. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Kate. So this is a white slide with teal text that says new alt text and extended description accessibility fields versus existing IPTC description field. So one of the most common questions we get is why do we need alt text and extended descriptions if we already have the IPTC description field? So I've pulled an image example from our museum's collections comparing these fields to help demonstrate the difference and to show you an example of the kind of images that we are dealing with. So this slide has an example image um, with the title new IPTC core fields and the alt text is a tooth mark scrape and puncture the back of a yellow chimpanzee Panchocogites varus skull USNM 450071 while the extended description reads tooth mark scrape and puncture the back of a yellow chimpanzee Panchocogites varus skull USNM 450071 there are two rows of puncture wounds the upper row has six identifiable punctures and has scrape marks emanating upwards from the punctures the lower row, located approximately one centimeter below the upper, has five puncture holes that are much deeper with three hole punctures on the right that also have upward scraping. 
The largest hole located on the lower left is almost one centimeter wide. There is a one centimeter scale in the lower left corner of the image. This next slide has the same example image from the previous with the IPTC description written out that says, right lateral view of a cranium of West African chimpanzee Pantrobugatius verus, USNM450071, showing predation marks likely caused by a leopard. This specimen was collected by J.W. Deluc from the Cote d'Ivoire or the Ivory Coast. So as you can see, the IPTC metadata description tells you about the image, providing um, extra contextual information that cannot be gleaned from looking at the image, while the alt text and extended description gave a visual description acting as a replacement for the image in total. Rebecca? Mute problems. Sorry. Um, so the Smithsonian is quite large and manages over 155 million collection items, 34 million digital collection records, and approximately 15 million digital images and counting across 21 museums, a zoo, several research centers, plus our libraries and archives. So this, so we need a solution that can accommodate our scale and complexity. So this diagram that you see is um, extremely simplified view of the core Smithsonian digital ecosystem that drives content to our websites, to our data sharing partners and external aggregators. The data flows are automated and use persistent identifiers, which are symbolized by the key on every single element to link every individual record and media file across all these systems on the back end from our museum databases, the central Smithsonian dams and our web services. Um, next slide. So the Smithsonian Open Access Initiative is a good example of our internal digital ecosystem at work. All a museum data manager needs to do is flag an image in their own database and it is automatically available in the Smithsonian Open Access Portal, shown in this screen cap of an elephant beetle specimen and its associated metadata. Next slide. <clears throat> In addition to our own websites, the Smithsonian takes um, the collections data and associated images and media and shares the content broadly, including to data sharing partners like the Digital Public Library of America. This slide shows the nearly 6 million Smithsonian records shared within the DPLA platform. Next slide. So the Smithsonian Natural History in particular also shares heavily to global research data portals, including the Global Biodiversity Information Facility or GBIF. The statistics for one of those data sets is shown in this screen cap. Um, all three of these automated data set generation methodologies that push data to our websites, data sharing partners and research aggregators would benefit from the same two embedded fields that could be shared consistently um, across all of our platforms, both internal and external. It will be a tremendous amount of work, especially for the existing images, but these new fields give us a means to help automate the sharing of this important content. Next slide. The addition of these fields <clears throat> will also contribute to the Smithsonian's larger efforts, not only to comply with the law and increase our accessibility, but to also improve the overall quality of our data to ensure it is more readily discoverable and reusable across all audiences. We have been using the FAIR and CARE data principles to help guide our efforts, of which ITPC can be a vital component of how we achieve that moving forward. Shown here is the logo slash slogan for these complementary sets of data principles. It says, be fair and care. And in the um, Zoom chat, I will put links to these two different data principles. So thank you. Our email addresses are in the PDF of the presentation if anyone has any questions or would like to reach out. Great, thank you so much. Um, that was fantastic to learn about um, your image description guidelines. Um, Mark Nichols dropped in the chat that um, uh, uh, he works at Accessible Technologies at Virginia Tech. They also have um, their own guidelines going. And that's fantastic to see um, because 
uh, that means that uh, organizations are really owning this, um, and that's that's fantastic. Um, thank you also to uh, Kate for explaining the differences between the IPTC uh, fields. Each one is unique and different, um, and we, we can get different information from each one, so that was very useful to see. And also just that, um, Rebecca, thank you for showing us that um, you know, that this is, you know, we're, we need to manage this at the source, absolutely, because there's a whole ecosystem um, surrounding your um, visual content. So that was fantastic. Um, so I think now uh, we're going to um, move over to Rachel's presentation. So Rachel, feel free to share your screen and cue that up. Um, and yes, uh, continue to drop any questions you have in the chat and we will answer them for you. Over to you, Rachel. Sorry, muting issues. <laughs> um, hi, so my name is Rachel Comerford, and as I said before, I'm the Senior Director of Accessibility Outreach and Communication for Macmillan Learning. Uh, this slide features uh, the title, Alternative Text in Higher Education Publishing, as well as a picture of me when I had much longer brown hair and much larger brown glasses. Uh, so Macmillan Learning is a privately held family owned education publishing services company. Um, our mission is to improve lives through learning. Uh, the way that we do that is by making sure that we're facilitating educational opportunities for teachers and for students. Um, and our goal is to inspire curiosity. Um, on this slide is also an image of uh, three diverse students um, smiling and obviously enjoying your Macmillan textbooks. Um, in order to address uh, um, improving lives through learning, one of the um, uh, uh, initiatives that we pursued is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and as part of the diversity, equity, and inclusion plan for Macmillan Learning, we have obviously um, taken a very serious approach to addressing accessibility within our content. Um, this goes um, across more than just the textbooks that we produce. Um, these include our ebooks, our learning management systems, our simulations, instructors' materials, the catalog that people go to in order to find our books and decide if they want to use them, any marketing material that we use in order to advertise our content. Um, and literally anywhere else an image can be used. And the reason that that's important is because this includes our internal systems and the people that we're working with, not just the people that we're working for, as in our students or our instructors. So we see this as an opportunity to rebuild the future of education and make sure that we're resetting expectations for another generation of learners to come into the working environment. Uh, we've done this by creating employee resource groups that are focused on accessibility, as well as introducing a lot of training materials and um, learning opportunities within our own staff in order to incorporate accessibility into uh, everybody's job roles. Uh, one of the biggest investments that we made in the past couple of years was in Global Certified Accessible by Benetech. This is an independent third party EPUB certification program. It's meant to verify ebook accessibility. Um, so we do this by creating born accessible content, which means that instead of um, trying to just make a book as quickly as possible and ignoring the accessibility of the content, we're looking at the way that we build the book and the way that we pr present the content from the very beginning of the life cycle. That includes conversations with authors about the language that they're using in their texts. And also, of course, the short and long extended alt text as a part of the baseline for the book that we produce. So to get into a little bit about what we're doing with our short and our long alt text, short alt text is always coded into our HTML. But our long alt text or the extended alt text, and there are um, different names for it, um, they used to be coded into the HTML. This used to be um, as Longdesk or ARIA described by Bill Kasdorf mentioned details. We're doing it a little bit differently now in order to address the needs of more users. And this is where alt text really plays a part in more people's lives than um, people who are using screen, screen readers. Um, we're now exposing extended descriptions as a link from the image. 
Uh, on the screen is a table of contents for the Easy Writer 8th edition, which is a Macmillan textbook. It includes the end of the table of contents, and at the bottom, the second to last entry says extended descriptions. It's highlighted with a red box and a yellow star in order to indicate its importance. Next to that is the extended descriptions table of contents for the same title, Easy Writer 8th edition. Um, this includes the uh, titles for each of the extended descriptions, uh, the page numbers in which the extended descriptions appear, and these are actively linked to the descriptions themselves. So the first one says EA1, which is actually a page number, um, and it says the front cover of the book, Easy Writer, 8th edition by Andrea Lunsford. Um, and then um, if you click on that, it takes you to the actual description. Um, when you're navigating through our alt text, within the text itself, um, there's a textual page. In this case, it says 30D, revising shifts between direct and indirect discourse, which is followed by a paragraph of basal text. It's just educational text for the student. Um, and then an image of a marked up sentence. And the sentence says, Bob asked what, um, and there's an up caret and the word he could, um, and then the word he is crossed out because it shouldn't be there, due to help. Um, and a, um, a question mark is crossed out and a caret is inserting a period. So this is teaching students how to correctly mark up a sentence. Below the sentence, which is presented as an image because of the editing marks, um, there is a small circle with an I in it meant to represent information. Um, when following the link for the extended description, um, you are told follow the follow link for or sorry for when rolling over you're told follow link for extended description of a paragraph with commentary in the margin identifying transition from preceding paragraph topic sentence supporting evidence and repetition of keywords and ideas it's a mouthful um but we wanted to avoid just saying following for extended description because it doesn't tell you what it's the extended description of so this is the title of the image that it's following um, these are not only rollover text, they're also linked icons that lead to the extended alt text. Um, within the extended alt text on this page, there is, um, again, the table of contents of all of the extended alt text, as well as the screen that shows the extended alt text for a sentence edited to revise shifts between direct and indirect discourse, along with an explanation of the edits. I really should have chosen something with a shorter title. Um, it includes the alt text, the extended alt text itself for the image, which is the sentence reads, Bob asked what he could do to help. The word he is added after what, and the word he that appears after the word could is crossed out. The question mark at the end of the sentence is changed to a period. Below that highlighted with a red box is a active link that says return to a sentence edited to revise shifts between direct and indirect discourse along with an explanation of the edits. Again, I should have picked something with a much shorter title. Um, and that brings you back to the basal text that you were reading before. So we're making really active use of all text in our books. Uh, the question of who writes it comes up very frequently. Um, we have authors and subject matter experts that contribute to the alt text. Um, the author, when they're helping to choose the image, provides a description of what they're looking for and the part that it's going to play in the text. This is important because when they're searching through image databases, whether it's the Smithsonian database or Getty or Shutterstock, we use some of those key terms that they asked for in order to find the image. Um, being able to pull that information as well as pull the alt text that was initially associated with the image makes a big difference in how we approach what we choose. Um, they can, we can also translate this initial communication into alt text once the image is selected. Um, there are other methods too, as somebody mentioned earlier, artificial intelligence being used to generate alt text. Um, we've seen both good and bad examples of artificial intelligence in the past. Um, the result is often oversimplified. Um, it's occasionally offensive. Uh, and um, I think the thing that we have to remember when we're looking at um, artificial intelligence for alt text is that AI 
is going to reflect the bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious, of the programmer that created it, which means that um, we are going to not see the things that the programmer doesn't see themselves. Um, my favorite approach is a combination. Uh, I think that starting with machine generated alt text can save time and money, especially when you're looking at a large volume of images. Um, but, and it also provides a really nice starting point for authors or subject matter experts who haven't written alt text before and are wondering where to start. Um, but I do think that there, it's important to have a human editor rework the language. Um, so the impact of the IPTC standard could be really huge in the way that we produce eBooks. Uh, the IBTC metadata can be read um, by some JavaScript libraries. Um, and if the alt text lives within the image itself, that means that a script could create the short description into the alt attribute in the HTML without us ever doing this um, cut and paste process that can introduce errors. Um, it can also generate a link um, and an element um, that contains that long description that I showed you in the textbook itself. Uh, at some point, we may even have a browser that can do this automatically, and so it could be really just built into an ebook pipeline. And that's it. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and as uh, John cues up his presentation, I'll just say, um, I love that term born accessible. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, we're talking about, you know, actually certifying the process for creating content um, to ensure that it's delivering accessible um, eBooks. And um, I'd like to see that carry over um, to other industries as well, who are also certifying. Um, and, you know, of course, what we're all going for here is born accessible images. Um, so hopefully we can, we can own that from the source. Uh, so thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, that was really interesting. Okay, John, are you are you ready to go? I am ready, ready. to go. Awesome. John Sasala speaking here. Uh, I just loaded up my deck, which has the title slide, uh, repeating the name of the conference and our specific uh, topic here. So the IPTC Photo Metadata Conference 2021, making images accessible across industries. How does it work and what's next? Uh, my specific industry is the marketing and web design industry. Uh, so addressing here the alt descriptions and image accessibility as it pertains to marketing and web design. On the slide, I've got my portrait, which is uh, the portrait I use everywhere, myself uh, in a suit with an open collar button down shirt, uh, slugging a large cup of carb, uh, Starbucks. Um, if I was a Ken doll and I came with an accessory, it would be a cup of Starbucks. So I think that's why it's okay for me to use that. Uh, I've got my name and title on here, John Sasala, president of Mori Creative Studios with the Mori Creative logo, uh, which is the words Mori Creative and a uh, orange square with a check mark in it, which is also the negative space in the M. Uh, we've also got the Inclusion Hub logo on here, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later in this presentation. Inclusion Hub being an initiative that Mori Creative is behind. So diving in, uh, the first slide I've got on the left hand side, the typical uh, an image of a typical web page that has a logo in the top left and a navigation across the top. Uh, it's got a hero area where there's the uh, H1, the main headline, and it says sample page headline. And then uh, typical body copy organized into sections. That's a H2 that says first main section, some text, and then a subsection, which would be an H3. When I say H, I'm referring to uh, the HTML heading tag that denotes that that is a, a uh, a different, the hierarchy of the headlines. On the right-hand side of that sample page is an image. It happens to be highlighted or, or outlined in red. Uh, below that, we have a contact form and then some social icons. So all just typical elements that are visually displayed on a web page. Now, on the right-hand side of this slide, I've got the HTML display, display of that exact web page. And the reason that I wanted to show this was to show the, all of the data that is used to render that web page. And there's so much more information that's contained inside of the HTML than just what's visually displayed. Uh, starting with the header section, which uh, is going to contain the page title. That's what appears in the tab of your browser. Uh, and it's also the first thing that's read whenever a screen reader comes to a web page. It's got metadata, like the author of the page and the description. And then it's got the main content of the page that's inside of the body. And those can be organized into something called landmarks. So a lot more information already that isn't visually displayed for somebody, but that information, that data, if properly coded, exists. 
Inside of that main landmark, we've got a bunch of those elements. We've got an H1, which is the first heading, sample page heading, with some descriptive text below, which is a paragraph. Then we've got an H2, first main section, with some text. Uh, we've got an image tag. We've got uh, other sections. We've got the form tag on there. So just the, the code representation of all of the different elements that exist. And the, the image tag specifically is also uh, um, bordered in red because I want to draw attention to that code specifically here. That code has the source file, which is where the image that's going to be rendered uh, is hosted. And it's also got an alt description. And the reason that it was important for me to show, in addition to what the image, where the image is hosted, but also that alt description, is because that's the information. In fact, all of this information is what search engines use to understand the content of a web page. And a search engine like Google is looking for things like the alt, uh, the, the the page description, the page title, the headings that are being used, the images that are being described, to understand what a web page is about so that it can serve good results when somebody is searching for something. The things that we look at with this HTML, this is called on-page SEO, the things that a web developer can control. And then there are other factors called off-page SEO um, that we don't control, like how much time does someone spend on the site and whatever it might be. But going to the on-page SEO, the things that we can control, that alt description, that is an opportunity for us to describe an image so that a search engine better understands it. But more importantly, this information, this HTML information is also what assistive technology or specifically screen readers are going to use to navigate through a web page. And to better understand this, uh, an example that I like to use is myself as a, as a sighted user. When I go to a web page, before I read anything, I will probably scroll to the bottom of the page and then scroll back up to the top to get started. And the reason that I might do that subconsciously is to get a lay of the land, to figure out what I'm about to embark on by reading this web page. Now, people who might be visiting a web page and using assistive technology want to do the same thing. They don't want to just start reading and hope that they landed on something that they wanted to spend time on. So they'll skim through a page by skipping to headlines. So they may, you know, check the H1 first. What is the main headline of this page? Okay, I know it's a sample page. Let me skip to the H2. Okay, it sounds like this is a main section. Let me skip to the next H2. Okay, great. Now I have an idea of how many main sections there are on this page. But if I'm misusing HTML, if I'm using a heading tag, maybe to visually stylize an element like a pull quote, well, then I'm abusing HTML and I'm messing up that structure for someone who's navigating a web page using that HTML markup. Um, and then jumping back to the image tag there, if I'm also not adequately describing an image, not only do search engines not know what that image is, but when a screen reader gets to that image, what's read to them, what's described to them in this example is alt equals, Team GA 495-09F39 underscore 1920.jpg. And I felt it was important for me to read that entire thing out because that's what somebody using a screen reader has to sit through. That does not adequately describe the image, but where did that even come from? I'm going to jump to the next frame here, which again has that sample web page on the left-hand side, but this time we've got an inset image over top that shows the image module that is used to place that image on the back end for the web developer when they're building this. Now, this is a screenshot from HubSpot. That is the CMS, the content management system that we at Mori Creative Studio use to build web pages. And this screenshot shows that I've selected the image that I wanna use in that position. And the alt text, which is again, circled in red, is pulling automatically the file name as the alt description. The headline on this page is image module setting default or missing alt text. The text reads, image module in a CMS, content management system, may pre-populate image alt text with the image file name. Some CMSs do not pre-populate alt text, but they also do not require it, enabling images to be published with no description. Either way, this results in images not being properly described. So either way, if it's defaulting to that file name or if it's not being left uh, or not being uh, included whenever published, whoever's using a screen reader to navigate a website is not going to have a good idea of what that image, um, what that image represents. At the bottom of this uh, slide, I've got a little line that says overlays claim to have a solution. If you're not familiar with overlays, uh, as people are trying to address the accessibility of their website, either for SEO purposes or uh, to be more inclusive, 
they may come across in the wild uh, something called overlays. Overlays, you may have come across uh, where I just revealed this on the screen, it would be an icon maybe in the bottom left or the bottom right of a web page that looks like an accessibility icon. And that's a control panel. And when you click that, it would dis uh, display a few user controls like increasing font size or uh, changing the color contrast of a web page. So some things that a user who is able to access that control panel can control related to the accessibility. And often when you see that icon in that control panel, that also means that uh, the system might be trying to remediate other things on the back end of the code, like filling in image descriptions. There's a lot of different things that we can go through that it, that it claims to do, that it you know, claims to fix the order in which headlines are on a page. But the way that it's gonna fix it is just to force that pull quote that was set as an H2 to an H3 because it's under an H2. It's not a headline. This overlay is fixing it by overriding what headline it is. Meanwhile, it wasn't a headline to begin with. But as it relates to uh, images, uh, these overlays will use artificial intelligence or um, um, OCR, uh, which is my next frame here, to render their version of a description. And before I dive into what's on this slide, I want to go back to you know a CMS that's pulling the title of an image as a description. We know that that's not a good description, but the argument that they might make is, hey, it's better than nothing, and there's a chance that that image might have a description, so that's their jumping off point. Um, but these overlay services will look for any missing alt text. And as this frame says, AI and OCR alt text examples, descriptions generated with artificial intelligence and OCR optical character recognition, so the ability to read the image of text, may lack important contextual details. So we've got on this frame or on this slide the image from that sample web page. And I've got on the right hand side, highlighted in red, the AI description that might be returned for this image. So this image is described as diverse group of coworkers working on laptops. And I got to tell you, that's amazing. The future is awesome. And the fact that these little robots can go out there and figure out that there are multiple people in this image, they're of different gender and races, and they have uh, not just rectangles on their laps, but their laptops. That's, that's incredible. But that's not good enough compared to the way that a human might describe this image. So below the AI description, I have a human description. Say the description was Jen and JD from the marketing department sit with Kendra from sales for their monthly SLA meeting. If that web page was about SLAs, was about service level agreements and how they're managed on a monthly basis, isn't that a much more appropriate description for that image for the per per person who's experiencing it rather than just this stock description? So I appreciate what artificial intelligence is trying to do, but it's just not good enough yet. Um, so I think going back to what Rachel said, there can be a combination of AI generated descriptions, but there needs to be that human component of confirming and in, in, um, uh, elaborating on or contextualizing the way that an image might be described. So to wrap up here, the web design benefits of properly managing images. I'm on the second to last slide. Um, the, the benefits that we see, I, I, I put into two different buckets from this conversation. First being accessibility, um, lowercase a and capital A accessibility. Properly described images ensure that all users have access to images regardless of the device that's used to explore that digital content. Now, we can all relate with an email inbox where images are not loaded. If you're using, uh, I think it's uh, Outlook, you, images are not loaded by default. But if you have an alt description on that image, that's going to be displayed. So it's improving accessibility for somebody who doesn't identify as, as having a disability, um, but it's just generally improving the accessibility of that image. Then we look at screen readers and text-to-speech tools. Obviously, the accessibility is extremely important there. Uh, and then we can be a little bit future-looking with voice devices. The way that Amazon Alexa or Google Home interact with digital content, it's important that they can access it. Now, now right now, I can't go home and say, Alexa, you know, read me the web page, the sample web page from Mori Creative Studios. But at some point, they will be able to go through and read out the content. And it's important that we're describing images so that, that can be experienced with you know, virtual reality and, and voice enabled devices and whatever future tech uh, comes at us. The second bucket that I put the uh, benefits into is discoverability. And I mentioned this before when talking about what search engines see when indexing a website, properly described images help search engines better understand the content of a page and increase the opportunity for ranking uh, for relevant searches. Now, 
that's not just for that web page to rank because you have more context and more content for the spiders to understand what that, that page is, but it's also the image ranking result uh, opportunities. When you properly describe an image and that web page does support um, specific search terms, when someone searches and they click on the image tab, you have more of a likelihood to be displayed there. And all sorts of different ranking opportunities inside of the, the search world um, do, uh, as it continues to evolve, are important to take advantage of. The different media assets that require alt text do, are not just contained to the web page or emails, like I described, but also any PDFs or, or uh, ebooks that are going to be downloaded from a web page. Uh, social media posts, it's important that images are described properly. If you're maybe letting people download a deck, like the decks that are provided at the IPTC conference here today, um, th they need to be described properly. And uh, this was touched on, on before by Sam, uh, video captions. Video captions are not alt descriptions, but it's important that that type of media, that that, that uh, multimedia does also contain uh, proper, proper descriptions. <laughs> So the last slide that I have on here is related to an initiative that Mori Creative is behind. Um, when you're getting familiar with digital accessibility and the service providers out there, uh, when you're being brought down the path of uh, an overlay service trying to sell you on the benefits of using them, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, so we, along with a couple other founding partners, have built out a platform called Inclusion Hub, which is a digital resource library of accessibility service providers. This last frame has the Inclusion Hub logo in the top left and a description inclusionhub.com is a resource directory of accessibility service providers and original content that's designed to help people make better decisions concerning digital inclusion. The URL is www.inclusionhub.com. On the right-hand side is a screenshot of that resource directory. I think we have somewhere in the range of about 350 or, or 400 listings that are in there. And more importantly, we have a, um, a blog environment, a news or an article environment where people can speak about their personal experiences and you know, um, compare different tools. So really a great resource for learning and better understanding digital inclusion. The founding partners, uh, their logos are on the bottom left. Uh, the first being Salesforce. Salesforce has an incredible internal uh, inclusion department um, where they're not just trying to improve the accessibility and diversity of Salesforce as an organization, but they also want to have a greater impact outside of just Salesforce as a company. So this is one of the initiatives that they've gotten behind. They have a lot of other great stuff that they're doing. The other, uh, the second founding partner there listed is Be My Eyes. If you're not familiar with Be My Eyes, uh, Be My Eyes is essentially an app that is compi comprised of about 4 million volunteers, sighted people who are willing to use the app to help non-sighted people who are navigating the world. So as a person with a, with a visual impairment, if you're maybe out there and um, you know, you're trying to figure out which gate you're supposed to go to at an airport, well, you can connect with a volunteer on Be My Eyes and say, yep, it looks like I'm at gate number four. Perfect. Thanks. Have a great day. Short little interaction, but fixes so much just by leveraging something like FaceTime. So Be My Eyes is also a, a founding partner of, of Inclusion Hub. And then uh, the organization that I'm with, Mori Creative Studios, we, as a digital marketing agency, we control digital properties. We build digital websites. And it's important that the people that build them are building them inclusively. So this is why uh, we're behind this. And I'm also really, really excited to announce that we have a fourth founding partner that's coming on, uh, a company named Fable. Fable is a platform of native assistive technology users that can help organizations with their product testing, with their website testing. I'm a developer. I built an accessible website. Let me actually test it with a human that uses assistive technology every single day confirm that what I think is a coder, I've coded out properly, confirm that you can get around it. So uh, really excited to bring Fable into the fold there. We continue to grow at Inclusion Hub and, and hopefully have a positive impact on the world. So, uh, so that's me. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here, Carolyn. Great, thank you so much, John. Thank you for showing us behind the scenes of a website. I feel like that's so critical. Um, yes, Google is actually crawling the words behind a website and the tagging. And um, you know, thank you for showing us where alt text lives. Um, and why that's so important. Um, so now we have about uh, 12 minutes left in this session and I wanted to get through a few um, panel discussion questions. First up, 20 years after WCAG, why do organizations continue to struggle with alt text? Why hasn't it happened yet in your opinion? 
I'll take a crack at that first. Um, it was something that you actually presented. I think it was an interview that I heard and you mentioned us the other day. Uh, it's because people aren't aware. And if you can't see, if myself as a sighted user, if I never have to experience alt text when I navigate through a website, I might not prioritize it. It's the same way that we uh, prioritize web, uh, I'm sorry, mobile accessibility or mobile responsiveness. Because I can physically see what my website looks on a mobile, like on a mobile device, I know to prioritize it. But if I can't see the alt text that could be poor or could be missing, I'm never going to address it. And I think that's consistent for a lot of web developers that are sitting in front of their desktop computers and don't really consider, well, what about someone who's not just viewing it on a mobile device, but with a screen reader? So I think the lack of that being visible to people is one of the reasons why it hasn't um, become more, uh, um, the awareness hasn't spread. That's a really that's interesting true, point. I take a slightly, sorry, I take a slightly less optimistic view, uh, which is we often treat accessibility as an inconvenience. Um, ableism is pretty deeply ingrained in our culture, from the language that we use to the products that we create. Um, I, I think about how easily aggravated we can become when an aging family member loses their hearing. It's not a choice they've made, but we treat them as though they're somehow complicit. Um, and I think that alt text carries a similar burden. We make excuses about it being too much work, it being too expensive, and the ableist environments that we've created enable those viewpoints. Yeah, I, I agree with Rachel. I think that has a significant amount of that element to it. Um, there's also, you know, like in our case, we're grandfathered in, so it becomes a, we'll get to it. It's important, but we'll get to it later. And for us, it's the scale that we're dealing with. Because like, how do I fix 15 million images, some of which are 30, 40 years old? Because we've been digitizing for an extremely long time. What does that look like? Um, and so I think you just get overwhelmed and you you push, you kick the can down. So which is why I'm very happy that Kaylin and Kate have been like, nope, this is important. We're gonna do this. Um, and so no, it's partly my job to figure out how we we do that moving forward. But that's certain the scale of it for us is certainly has been a huge impediment. I think a lot of it too also has to do with the education. Like when we learned how to, you know, take pictures or how to use Microsoft Word or PowerPoint, we didn't learn how to make things accessible from the start. And when you have to sit down and relearn how to make a PowerPoint person accessible without having to go back and fix everything once it's finished, it's it, it's a learning curve, but once you know how to make something accessible from the start, it, it's just as fast as it would have been had you learned it up front. So I think that's, it's also daunting to have to sit there and be like, okay, now I have to relearn Microsoft Word and what I can and can't do. And it, it sucks, but it's something that I think we need, you know, classes on how to make things accessible from the start, but then it's the problem of like, how do we get people to actually like take those classes? So education's a big problem. You know, this is Kaylin speaking, and I just wanted to emphasize a point that Kate just made about the education is that, especially for smaller museums, often it's a, it's a crew of maybe 10 running the whole museum, and that includes the website, and there's that lack of education and understanding of what alt text is meant to accomplish for the user. Um, so they're building a website, and they honestly have never encountered questions of alt text because they, you know, it's this perpetual cycle of inaccessibility where they don't know the alt text exists, so they don't know how to write it meaningfully. Um, and somebody from the blind and low vision community can not interact with it, so they don't see the blind and low vision community interacting with their assets, so they don't know it's an issue. So it just perpetually plays on itself. Um, and I'm really hopeful that we're, we're in a position now where we can start changing that and make it more inclusive for everybody. Great point. I, I hope the very same thing. I think just, yeah, taking alt text out of hiding and start talking about um, creating it from the very beginning um, across industries is, is how we get there and how we make progress. Um, so next question, and maybe one of one or two of you can, can answer this. Um, accessibility um, is not an inexpensive <laughs> task. Um, it requires a lot of internal resources, right? Just learning to, to get um, to start writing it and to implement new workflows. Um, also, sometimes you need to argue for budget. Um, so maybe if you can jump in on what's your best advice for securing time and budget um, to do the accessibility work that you want to do. Um, I'll take a crack at this first, I guess. Um, 
I think museums really need to figure out how to frame image descriptions and alt text into larger conversations of ongoing inclusivity concepts. Um, you want to reframe the question as like, what, what are we doing now to make our information inclusive and accessible? And what role can alt text play in those actions? And how can it include people otherwise left out? And you go to funders and you say, you know, if you fund this project concept and I get favorable results, will you will you fund a pilot project? And you know, once you frame it that way, once you show its relevance with the project concept and that pilot test, and you can show it can be done, you can make an argument that it's not a cost, it's actually an investment. You're you're investing in increasing your user base in future technology changes and providing fully accessible digital assets. And a museum's goal is to connect people to assets, to allow connections and relationships to thrive. And in order for people to make those connections, the assets must be in a format that is consumable to everyone. And I apologize because this is Kaylin speaking again. Uh, this is Rachel speaking, and thank you for, for subtly pointing that out. Um, <laughs> uh, I totally agree with Kaylin. I, I think that that is the best possible approach. I think too often we lean on fear as a motivator. Um, the fear of lawsuits, the fear of public shaming, the fear of reprisals. Um, and I would love to see more companies move in that direction of, of inspiration instead of fear. Fantastic. And I'd like to ask a question from the chat box that just came in from Stephanie. Um, Stephanie says, very interesting conversation. Couldn't some of accessibility um, issues be more appropriately addressed by providing employment opportunities for qualified people within the disability community throughout every organization from top to bottom? I think that's such an interesting point, and I'd love to hear your feedback on that from the panel. I think that that, I'm sorry, this is Rachel. Thank you, Kaylin. <laughs> uh, I think that that plays a really big part in, um, in securing that time and budget that you talked about before. When we um, hire people to review our products, we should be including people with disabilities. When we hire our teams in order to make these products, we should be hiring a diverse staff. I think the, one of the best ways that we could secure the time and budget for this work is to recognize that this audience is all around us. It's and honestly, is to recognize that we might be a part of this audience. I think one of the most interesting things for myself as I became involved in accessibility was to have that moment where I um, realized that I have an invisible disability, that I'm impacted by these things. And I've always, I had always kind of othered myself um, from that group and from that label. And it really changed the way that I approached things. Fantastic. Yes, Lindsay dropped nothing about us without us, um, which is a fantastic um, focus uh, for many organizations to have. Um, so we just have a few more minutes, um, and I'm curious to get your perspective on um, the addition of these new IPTC accessibility fields and what that means for your industry. Um, because, uh, you know, after so many years, we finally have a new approach um, to actually tackling alt text. So uh, what do you think, um, you know, in terms of, you know, making changes, how, how could these new fields be adopted? John Sasala here speaking. Um, I'm happy to jump in first. Uh, I think that it's another demonstration of how the future is awesome, how we see that there's a problem and uh, the fact that these descriptions are not moving with the images as they make their way around the internet. Well, this is certainly a step in the right direction. Um, you know, when we try to approach digital accessibility in the marketing space, in the web development space, we say, oh, it's up, it's up to the developers, it's up to the content developers who are producing this content to make it accessible. But, um, you know, going back to the, to the point about education, it needs to start in the education system. It also needs to be the platforms that people are using that are encouraging good behavior and introducing something like an alt text accessibility fee, um, um, information on images means that those CMSs, instead of pulling a file name as the default can start with that because it exists, but it's not until it exists that can we, we can use that as a jumping off point. So this is certainly a first step in the right direction. Next is to get the platforms, either the providers, the um, Getty images, or you know wherever the images are being uh, distributed, getting them to adopt it and getting the CMSs, WordPress. WordPress cannot introduce a plugin for images unless it uses these things. So I think that that's gonna be the next phases for this, really requiring it on the platform level. Fantastic. Does um, do one of you from the uh, Smithsonian maybe want to jump in here? Because um, what I've been very impressed with is uh, you taking ownership from you know 
just actually writing these descriptions at the source, uh, because that helps others down the road um, be able to have the option of using um, alt text that's actually created um, by all of you. And, um, you know, that just makes better quality alt text on the web. So what are your thoughts from, you know, being the source of images um, in what this can do to change things? I think a, a big point is that it's going to hopefully increase the quality of the output of our descriptions. So in the guidelines that Kayla and I are authoring, um, we spend a lot of time emphasizing that these descriptions need to be written that, um, to be able to be then pulled into a specific context and tailored to that context. So um, it takes a lot of practice to learn how to write these descriptions. Um, but once we have the guidelines in place, those guidelines are just like an absolute map. So I think um, like within each like area where you are adding these image descriptions to the images themselves, if you have that guideline in place where you can just go down the list, make sure you have each of these elements, I think it makes the process a lot easier and also helps the quality then. Um, so that once we are producing like quality, images that are you know, being used in a website, being used in someone's textbook, um, they can then take our quality descriptions and then tailor them to the context that they are using them in. It's fantastic. Well, um, I just want to thank all of you for participating today. I feel like I could talk to you all day, <laughs> but we are at time. Um, and uh, it's, you know, I just like to close with, this is the beginning and it's really excited to see ideas being generated um, from these new fields and um, your continued work in improving all text. So thank you to our panelists and I will pass it over to David who's moderating our next session.